Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I look forward to getting this institution focused on solving problems rather than jurisdictional issues. And I'd like to thank uh, Chairman McCall and Chairman Chaffetz for their leadership and ranking members Thompson and Cummings uh, for working on issues like this in a bipartisan fashion. And it's great working alongside you, Mr. Richmond. I'd especially like to thank uh, my good friend Robin Kelly for her partnership um, over the last year, and I'm looking forward to working together with you this year. This is an important topic. Eight panelists, a bunch of chairmen, a bunch of subcommittee chairmen, a lot of ranking members, and one of the reasons is that it's been estimated that 97% of all Fortune 500 companies have been hacked, and the other 3% um, have been and just don't know it. <laughs> and this is the, the size and scope of the cyber problem this nation is facing. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Anthem, most recently Juniper Networks and OPM were the sensitive PII of 21.5 million Americans who, whose data was stolen. And just a few examples of the ongoing digital threat our nation faces every single day. Our adversaries are constantly targeting our information technology, and in doing so, they steal our intellectual property, healthcare data, and the most private details of the lives of millions of Americans. So when in May of last year, the Bureau of Industry and Security at the Department of Commerce published a draft rule implementing an export control regime on some of the most basic cybersecurity tools and methods, I became deeply concerned about the potential for unintended circumstances and consequences. The truth is that cyber weapons are not analogous uh, to conventional weapons that the Wassenaar Agreement has been discussing and regulating since its exception. The same code that can be used to steal, disrupt, or destroy can also be used to protect. My concern and concern shared by many of those companies and experts who submitted comments to BIS over the summer is that the language of the proposed rule is so broad and vague that if implemented, it would do profound damage to our nation's cybersecurity posture. The IT subcommittee is very interested in the process that the State Department employed when, when adding these highly technical and complex cybersecurity items to the Wassenaar's export control regime. Um, where, where experts, the cybersecurity industry, or the IT community at large included in the discussions leading up to the agreement? If not, why? And how can we make sure they are consulted in the future so this kind of thing doesn't happen again? Cybersecurity practitioners have to move at the pace of technology. They cannot stop and wait to push a critical patch out to their international partners or clients who are left vulnerable while regulators delay and bureaucrats impose mountains of red tape. In the cybersecurity business, the clock starts when you know you've got an indicator of compromise and doesn't stop until you know it's been patched. In no time at all, a vulnerability can be exploited and data extracted. With months, hackers can take their time and do unspeakable damage to American interests. One of the reasons the IT subcommittee exists is to examine the impacts information technology has on our laws, governmental structures, society writ large, and our regulatory approach. The question here today is not only whether or not the Wassenaar nations need to rethink and redraft those cyber tool controls, but also whether or not an export control regime is the correct institution to solve the problem of keeping dangerous digital tools out of the hands of despots. I thank Chairman Ratcliffe for his shared interest in this issue, and I look forward to today's discussion. I yield back.